To wrap up, I want to address a couple of uh, concepts that we can use to guide our treatment. And this is going to have some very specific injury types in it to help us classify and then think of the right resource for the patient. One of the first things we can do, though, in managing patients that have suffered critical trauma injuries is get them off the scene in a short period of time so that we can minimize the time they're away from definitive care. This speaks directly to our golden period of time. Now, getting off scene in 10 minutes is very difficult. The more things we have to do on a scene, the longer it'll take us to do those things. So it takes prioritization, identifying things that we will not do on scene and things that we will shift to the ambulance, and probably having somebody watching the time. Now I say this because if you have a crew that is all managing the patient, including the highest level provider, then that crew is not likely to determine time in the same way that somebody observing the situation would. So it's important that when you have critical trauma patients, you delegate the task, if you're going to be managing patient care, delegate the task of keeping time to somebody who will be hands off. This could be someone who's not a medical provider. For example, if law enforcement's not actively involved in a process, you could ask them to notify you in time intervals. It's important that you have time countdowns, especially around eight minutes, nine minutes, and a warning to 10 minutes. You need to prioritize your care and evacuate that scene as quickly as possible. Now, you're going to do this in certain circumstances. PHTLS on page 35 and 36 of the ninth edition and in boxes 2-7 have outlined the requirements for a rapid off-scene time. The first is if the patient has an inadequate airway. Inadequate airway is a critical life threat and needs to be managed. You'll manage it with the least invasive measure on scene as possible and then elevate your measurement, your invasive device in the ambulance when possible. But there are circumstances in which intubating the patient on scene is required, but you'll do so by sacrificing your scene time. Patients that have an SpO2 that's less than or equal to 94% need to be off scene. Patients that have signs of dyspnea, patients with suspected open pneumothorax, flail chest, pneumothorax, and tension pneumothorax suspected. Patients that have significant external hemorrhage or suspected internal hemorrhage. Patients that are either in compensated or decompensated shock, not just decompensating. Patients with abnormal mentation, which can include a GCS of 13 or less, seizure activity, and or sensory or motor deficit. Penetrating trauma to the head, neck, torso, and proximal extremities, or the extremities portion that's closer to the body, generally closer than the elbow or the knee. Amputation or near amputation, proximal to fingers or toes. Trauma that has with it patients that have pre-existing major illnesses of our major organs, things like cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease or insufficiency, neurologic disorders. Patients that are on the spectrum of age with children and patients older than 55 years of age being qualified as emergent. Hypothermia, patients that also have trauma and burns. Patients that have pregnancies greater than 20 weeks with trauma. Provider judgment of other conditions can be used to determine those not covered by this list. Now, when we're determining where to take our patients, there's further principles that can help us. In this day and age, it's not uncommon for ERs to have 80 people in the waiting room almost all the time. And so with that, our trauma centers are certainly being overwhelmed. We don't want to take all trauma patients to a trauma center. Some patients are worth taking to lower level facilities or non-trauma centers for trauma care when appropriate. So page 35 of PHTLS's ninth edition in box 2-6 has outlined the things that will qualify as mechanisms requiring transport to a trauma center. Those include major falls, defined as adults falls greater than 20 feet, keeping in mind that a one-story building is generally about 10 feet in height, children who have fallen greater than 10 feet or fa fallen greater than two to three times their height, High-risk motor vehicle collisions can be defined as intrusions where more than 12 inches has made its way into the occupant compartment, including intrusion through the roof, intrusion greater than 18 inches into the vehicle anywhere, not limited to the compartment, partial or full ejections, situations in which there is a death in the vehicle, patients that have uh, been subjected to high-speed and high-risk injury, Patients that were in vehicle versus pedestrian accidents in which or pedestrian or bicycle resulted in being thrown, run over, or the impact was greater than 20 miles per hour. 
Motorcycle cra crashes greater than 20 miles per hour also warrant being transported to a trauma center. Now, there are certainly situations in which are not listed here, but please use your judgment to make sure that we're using resources appropriately. Now, to wrap up, I just want to remind us that there are three major event phases in trauma. The phases of trauma care include pre-event phase, event phase, and post-event phase. Most of our traditional EMS work is done in the post-event phase, and we're generally at a loss because there's some time that's occurred from the initial time of their injury to when we've arrived on scene. If we can intervene in cases before the injury happens through mechanisms of engineering, enforcement, and education, when patients get injured and we're not present, if we can educate them to do things like stop the bleed, if they can have access to enhance 911 with medical priority dispatch or other types of pre-arrival instructions in which they'll tell patients how to apply things like tourniquets and direct pressure. All of those things make it easier for patients to survive in the face of the challenges that we're trying to address. So involve in your downtime when patients are not involved in the injuries, in your program's injury prevention activities, and seek out opportunities so that you can grow as a provider and your community can grow and avoid having trauma injuries altogether. I hope this review of trauma principles and pearls has been helpful to you. As always, send me any questions that you have. I'd be happy to try and answer them, and we'll see you next time. Stay fly and be safe.